Great. Okay. Can I start off by asking you just to introduce yourself and just talk to me generally about the projects that you were involved with during your career? Oh, all right. I'm Roy Dowett. Um, I was born and brought up in Southampton. I went to Bristol University uh, to study aeronautical engineering, uh, specialising in aeroelasticity. I was an enthusiast for space, the stage, the avid reader of science fiction. I joined the British Interplanetary Society as a student. And when I was offered a post at Farnborough, I opted for guided weapons because that was the best one could do to get to near to space. Um, I arrived just at the time that Blue Streak was, was picking up at Farnborough. Uh, so I found myself in the Blue Streak team uh, particularly worried about the re-entry vehicle problems, that's hypersonic flow and all that sort of thing. Um, that meant I got involved with the test vehicle, uh, Black Knight, and of course for my sins, being the youngest member of the team, uh, I was the secretary of the Blue Street Aerodynamics Panel, and the assistant secretary, which meant I was full-time secretary also, of the Materials Panel. And I had to attend the Black Knight panel, and any other one was guidance control that I wasn't on. So I was actually in a position of knowing what was going on at the REE end. There are seven panels run by uh, de Havilland Propellers as well on Blue Street, which I was involved in. So although I was junior, I knew what was going on across the board. Um, we started to get involved in the potential of Blue Street as a satellite launcher. And from 1958, we were given money to start looking at that as a possibility. And by 1960, we had a good idea of what the possibilities were. In terms of, of that time, when it was sort of the post office wanted a satellite telecommunication, the astronomers wanted a large orbital um, flight, you know, to get uh, to look at the universe and so on. Um, it was in those sort of terms. And we then started talking, well, the minister wanted us to talk to the French. We had thought that that meant we provided the launch vehicle and the others provided the rest, you see. Um, it wasn't to be like that. The French just wanted to learn as much as they could about rocketry. Uh, and they insisted, really, on having a stage. So, yes, we agreed on that. We also um, then imagined that we would still provide the upper stage and then the Germans came in. So we, we lost it on that. And in fact, the trouble with Aldo, and I was on um, an Aldo, Aldo committees uh, for a while, which was fun up to a point, but we used to meet every three weeks. You know, now, if you uh, have a meeting, a one day meeting in Munich, and you would go one lunchtime, you have the meeting, and then, because you can't fly back, so you fly back the next day, you'd lost three days, you know, out of three weeks. You know, and I didn't really have staff, at my end, you know, so I wasn't actually making any progress, you know, it was very difficult in that sense. Um, but we made that. But I think the problem was that both the French and the Germans were incredibly greedy. Um, and even the um, ESA's official history admits that the UK had very good grains for actually backing out of Eldo and so on. Uh, we were getting nothing out of it at all. We were paying through the nose for something which we already had our bit working. You know, the excuse that the other countries had that the, the UK only brought, was only bringing them in because the, the UK knew there was problems just wasn't true. You know, we were there. Um, in parallel, uh, the Black Knight vehicle, um, which had been doing work to look at, um, to support really Blue Street side of it, um, we had borrowed equipment from the Americans called Gaslight to look at the actual re-entry observables. Um, and that was quite exciting because in Australia, where there's clear sky and things like this, you know, you get these very bright streaks across the sky and laid bangs and so on. Um, so uh, cancellation, the discussion with Americans through the TTCP uh, route, was that we'd have a joint program called Dazzle, where the Americans provide uh, a very large radar and some um, tracking equipment. The Australians provide all sorts of optical equipment, very long focal length um, 
spectrometers and cameras and so on. And we will supply some carefully tailored experiments. Because uh, come 1962, the UK, who have been pursuing studies of anti-ballistic missiles in the UK, had reached the conclusion that it wasn't on in the short term because there was no computing power in, in available mainframe computers. There was no decent radar that could switch around across all the targets and so on. And what's more, we didn't know what they were looking for. <laughs> you see, what the discriminants would be. Now, we knew the computers would solve because of the technology was moving along. We knew the radar problem would be solved eventually because phased array radars were being designed at that stage. But nobody knew what the discriminants would be. So Dazzle was all about trying to see what the observables might be. So that went from 62 to 64, 65 sort of period where the sad conclusion was is that the designers of the entry bodies could control what the observables were. So that the defense had no sure discriminants and so on. So although we had programs called, a program called Crusade with an upgraded um, Black Knight, uh, and the Americans came in with a program called Sparta, and then we had a follow-up program called Polaru, uh, which um, were all aimed at increasing our knowledge and so on, the drive to solve these problems wasn't there. Partly because on the weapon side, um, in 62, we, um, with Skyvolt having been cancelled, and Skyvolt, from my point of view, um, we were interested in the re-entry vehicle design because I had that background, but we were very worried about putting decoys onto it. We thought flying the way the Americans had built it was not going to be good enough. And the Americans were not taught telling us about decoys, so we had our own ideas what to do. But it got cancelled before it got anywhere. We bought Polaris with eight decoys. So we in the UK said, well, oh my God, why do we want this early form of missile with eight decoys? You know, well, the Russians are building an ABM system. You know? So he we said, well, put up proposals. And um, we got the ministry to give us money for study. And by 1964, we put out the feasibility report then by 66, a project definition report of a really HR 169 was a, a very good scheme for defeating what there was then the intelligence assessment of what the Russians were going to do. Then the Russians pulled Galosh and ABM through Red Square. Uh, and we realized that in fact, what the Russians had done, they changed direction, we're going for something else. And all we've been spent several years developing was not wasted, but it was only a part of the answer. So in 1967, we had to sit down again and say, where are we going from here? Now, the problem with this is that, um, I say, in 1960, we were in Council Blue Street and we were ready to worry about satellite launching. The government knew it had to spend money on Skybolt and Polaris, so it said, there's only so much money for rocketry, goodbye, <laughs> the space programme, you see. Come... 1966-67, when we persuaded everybody that um, a smaller satellite launch was on, um, we had tried to persuade people to put a hydrogen oxygen st stage on Black Knight, which would have been very, quite viable for small satellites. Um, but then Aldo gave the um, hydrogen upper stage to the Germans, so that stopped the UK doing that research. We come up with this larger Black Knight about two, which um, say run into the sand. But we then persuaded people that let's beef it up a bit more to get Black Arrow. You see, and Black Arrow looked like going to be the way forward. And lo and behold, just about when we got Black Arrow got going, the Polaris Improvement Program came along, you know, and they said, "Well, the money's got to go into that, <laughs> not into Black Arrow." So we had a situation in 1970 going out to Australia and telling the Australians that, I'm sorry, the UK's cancelled Black Arrow. And we had a problem for a year or two of not being able to tell them that we were going to replace something cheaper that did the job we wanted to do, which was full stuff, you know, but it wasn't, did, didn't have the prestige that Black Arrow would have had. Now, that was rather sad for the UK because we also had the situation that the sort discussions going on with the Americans and Russians about limiting ABM at that stage. 
uh, the UK government thought there's no point in the UK appearing to try to improve Polaris while they're discussing eliminating ABMs altogether. You know, so no money was provided by the UK in the UK for industry to do work uh, on a UK launcher to actually help us do the research for a weapon, let alone to do space research. You know, and that was all died for a while. So that when we actually got to go ahead in the 1970s to start doing a proper feasibility study, we found that the, the Black Arrow had disappeared. Yeah, when I say disappeared, the team had broken up and things like this, and it wasn't really able to reconstruct it. Although the Black Arrow vehicle in two-stage version would have been ideal for the development work we wanted to do. But fortunately, I say, the firms hadn't really given up and we were able to cobble together a team to build the full staff and all its supporting equipment from Saunders Row and companies like that and so on. Um, we were into Polaris and Polaris improvements. Um, the launcher division in Space Department, um, which I say had been pursuing the Black Arrow and its derivatives and so on, was basically wound up. We did a study in 71, 72 on could the UK produce a large rocket to be like Trident Mark I. Uh, um, and that was a rather disappointing one. We had to basically say the trouble with stopping research 10 years before is that we could pick up from where we were, you know, but we, needed, we should have done the 10 years of work in between. And the UK did not have a large solid propellant rocket technology. I mean, Stone Chat was three foot diameter. It wasn't five or six feet, you know, is what we wanted. And we didn't have a um, improved rocket engine in the liquid propellant sense uh, so because we hadn't pursued the ones for um, on the um, on Blue Streak, see, for the Aldo vehicle. So it really was a, a disappointing uh, situation. Um, the UK, of course, was in terrible economic straits, which you might remember in the 70s. Um, we had inflation rates like 25%. You know, um, Chevrolet got ham hammered when it got into service by being so expensive. It had gone from a quarter of a billion to a billion over 10 years. Um, and that's almost entirely due to inflation. Um, if you remember, inflation was, before inflation started, you could buy four gallons of petrol for a pound. And by the time you were getting one gallon for a pound or more, you know, it, that sort of thing. Um, and that, that tends to be forgotten, you know, that uh, we've lived through it and we've learnt to live with it, you know, like we, a litre of petrol costs us a pain nowadays and so on, you know, rather than a, a gallon. Um, the emphasis in the uh, 70s, besides the Polaris Improvement Programme, was on mini satellites and effort was put into it, Farnborough and the Space Centre, in getting small satellites in a standard format so that we could do cheap experiments. And I suppose the spin-off of that was in fact what Sp uh, Surrey University picked up and so on, because the RAE work in the end um, disappeared. The RAE had pursued um, this uh, electrical propulsion scheme, starting with Brian Day back in the 50s as a good idea. Uh, it had been worked up, so by the middle of the 1970s, there had been no application appeared, so it was cancelled. And of course, in cancellation means everything went into the skip. But fortunately, one or two of the components had been lent to universities, or David Fern had actually kept stuff in his attic. So when 10 years on, they actually said, no, you know, the future of uh, long-term space research is actually uh, electrical propulsion, he was actually able to say, ah, well, you haven't got anything, but I can find some of the old reports, I can find some hardware, and we can start the programme again. And he'd been pursuing it. I think no modern satellites actually believe in electrical propulsion for, um, I mean, we, we've got one that's got to the moon recently, and so on, uh, for that sort of thing. Certainly for attitude control, because the efficiency is so great compared with anything else. And if one's honest, the only way to get to interstellar space, in other words, get past Pluto and so on, is actually electrical propulsion. Nothing else will keep going long enough to do that. So that's where the future is. So 
that's the bright side of thing in a way. Where's my career? Well, my career's zigzag through all this sort of stuff. Um, partly because the RE um, or the UK space community was all small. You know? um, in each area, there was one or two experts, you know, but nobody else. You know? um, that's the way it was. Another problem with the UK is that teams are all small. Well, compared with the Russians and Americans, anyhow. Um, it showed up in one or two areas, like um, when a, a bomb, when the BL-755 bomblet, uh, that's cluster bomblet, was um, proposed, the RE said, well, for the sum of money that we intend, that looks like a team of 10. So they nominated 10 people and hunting said, oh, obviously the RE's thought where the problems are and named 10 people would match them. Of course, as you would expect, the real problems were in the gaps of, the, of expertise and so on, which is how I got involved. So I was dragged in because the bomb that was in dire trouble and so on. And in fact, I ended up going out to Australia to actually plan some of the drop tests on the Salt Lake, uh, which was quite exciting. Um, they were quite exciting with the bomblet because I came back and said, the one thing you don't want to do is to drop your cluster bomb on a Salt Lake. Because when the first one goes off, it will blow bits of salt up and will set all the others off. I was told, oh, I'm too pessimistic. Don't worry, we'll go ahead. So the first one they dropped, the first bomb that blew up the salt, set off all the others in a most brilliant display of fireworks, I might say. And then the range safety officer said, how many craters are there? Five. How many should there have been? 30 odd. He said, right, I'll put a fence around off of that. That's now um, you're not allowed to go into the area. Not allowed to look, it's dangerous. <laughs> yeah. um, and that's the sort of thing, I suppose it's the, the un not the unexpected, that one of the problems, you can't think of everything. You know? And I think one of the successes of um, the space industry is that the trick we learnt was procedures, you know, that you didn't do anything without a proper written procedure. You know, when you're talking about something which has to work for days, if not months or years, automatically, you know, being ultra careful is the way forward. Uh, and what I can remember, a man like Bob Reeds, who just was very good at writing uh, credible, you know, so the uh, understandable procedures, so on. And of course, when you wrote the procedure, you had to approve it. So you had to do slow run-throughs with lots of observation of it and things of that sort. Um, but on the whole, that meant that when you actually got around it, as long as the inspector saw that you were doing it, you know, all the things in the procedure, there was a good chance you'd done the right thing. Didn't always work out like that, you know. Um, there was one glorious example on Black Knight where we... Uh, BK-18, where we were having a machine ROF Patrikov. And when it was delivered, that's the shell was delivered to Farnborough, we put it on the uh, 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 moments of inertia measuring rig, and it didn't fit the tool we had for mounting it on. So a quick check with the dimensions said it wasn't the shape it was asked to be. We asked the inspectorate at Patrikov and said, hey, this isn't the right shape. He said, but it's machined to a former. He said, well, how can it be? So they came down with the former, you see. And of course, the former was actually held at one end, you know, and it slipped, you see. So they had all these apologies, and we said, well, now what we're going to do with this thing is the wrong shape. You know? And they said, well, fortunately, it's not only the wrong shape, but it's lighter than it should be. And the two things compensate, you see. So we went ahead and we wrote the things around all changed all the documentation, said, this thing's all right, carry on. Unfortunately, when it got out to Australia, and the teammate in Australia hadn't got the updates to the documentation. So they saw this, didn't realise it was the wrong shape, but certainly realised it was several kilograms light. See? So what did they do? They added ballast, you see. Now that was all right, but when it did its re-entry, it didn't slow down in the way we'd intended it hit the sandstone rock 
it Mark III Plus and made a 13 foot 6 hole in the sandstone. Yeah. Uh, one thing we did get is that the tape recorder on board stopped at the moment of impact. We knew precisely to a fraction of a second when we reached the grain. Uh, the biggest problem was we had to get in, um, well, 70 miles down range, a, a, a digger to dig the bit of tape. And we actually found that we passed through several opal beds. You know? The problem with opal beds in Australia is that they're very popular. You know? And the last thing we could let is the outside world know it because we'd have all sorts of people on the range digging for opals <laughs> and so on. So we had this fundamental problem. Uh, I know the range of vehicles delivered back to me is several bucket loads. It was all in little pieces, you know. And I had a glorious two or three weeks actually trying to put the jigsaw back together again. And I have a photograph of all this <laughs> assembled as on. But actually, it was the best tape recording of any of the flights we had at that time and the best data we had, you know, which is one of the whole stories of the Black Knight program, that nearly every, pro every flight produced something we didn't expect. But we got what we wanted out of it. No, no not necessarily in the manner we had intended. Um, there were things I was at, I hope to be talking about it um, after a coffee break. Um, there were things like we thought it would be a good idea to get the re-entry vehicle to come in ahead of the booster. Normally it was, wasn't done like that. So we arranged to turn the vehicle over after all burnt and fire something down and push it off with a little sabo that's retained with a uh, nylon lanyard. That was all very well, you know. Um, on the ground, we did endless trials at Lark Hill and in the vacuum chamber and so on, and we were convinced we had a very good idea. It's going to work well. Right? The first one we flew failed. Uh, the, when I say failed, the sabo didn't work and so on. Um, what was happening after we did lots and lots of tests, what we didn't know, we didn't know about the chemistry of nylon. Nylon has about 10% attached water. And when it gets into vacuum, this attached water vaporizes. And as it vaporizes, it cools down what's left. So the nylon was getting cold and going brittle. You know, um, so it, when you knew it, you actually then tried various varieties of nylon in a vacuum chamber and, and cold condition until you found one that worked. Um, the moral of this story is, of course, that on Beagle 2, the uh, use of lanyards and nylon material for the parachute, they had changed their design far too close to flight to have ever done a proper environmental trial. Uh, so they couldn't say in the end, whether in fact they used the right or the wrong, or whether they used the wrong sort of nylon is one of the reasons for their problems. Um, part of our difficulty has been that anything associated with weaponry, one day, it's been hard to get published, the experience of it. You know, partly because the people involved have no incentive to write it up. They're all moving on to the next job and things like that. Um, and it's all cumbersome to actually get papers approved, you know. So on the whole, this experience doesn't get um, there. And the trouble with Beagle 2 is, the, I'm talking about experience that occurred 30 to 40 years earlier on, so none of the people who did Beagle 2 would have known about the problems that we'd had in the early days. Oh, and another problem with Black Knight is that, um, and turning it over, or turning it away, is that we drove the Black Knight to fuel exhaustion. Obviously, if you want the maximum velocity, you went to the last drop. But what was not realised is that when you run out of fuel, there was still a little HTP left in the catalytic pack. And although that was a dribble of a sort of Newton's level rather than tens of thousands of pounds, you know, um, it was enough in space to deflect the thing. And the first thing we discovered, uh, I think on BK06, is that having separated the experiment, the main stage, the dribble, ran into it and banged it. Banged it hard enough for the onboard equipment to think it started re-entry. So it deployed its parachute on the way up. 
You see? So when it came in, it went up to 400 miles. Here. When it came in, there was this thing slowly tumbling, wrench of your core, long um, shrouds, and the parachute end over end the rib. And of course, there was the panic because nobody could understand how something that was spinning this way could end up like that. Until we had a, f a mathematical physicist who said, oh, it's two lines of um, uh, matrix algebra to actually show <laughs> the way uh, all the energy, de um, because the thing's flexible, uh, the energy, uh, angular energy um, uh, migrates from one mode of motion into the largest moment of inertia, things of that sort. In fact, we were able to explain why that happened to the Explorer satellites, the first one the Americans launched. It did just that, it was spun, and within a day or two, it was tumbling end over end. Um, and there were Americans going around saying, hey, we either got aliens or the Russians attacking us, and so on. Um, yeah, it's... It's things like that, as I say. Oh, another one, uh, we'd learnt this business of running down, so we had a bonker that pushed the vehicle out the way. So there was another rain, seven, where we separated it, but the rocket motor doing the separation failed. So it separated but didn't move away. And the stage come round and hit it. Now the first hit turned it over. The second hit stopped it turning. So actually we entered exactly the way we expected it, even though the system had failed. <laughs> so, uh, you can't, you don't lose them all. <laughs> <laughs> this, that's absolutely brilliant. I mean, that's, that's exactly what I'm, you know. Yeah. Um, can we just backtrack a bit and just talk in a bit more detail about the development work that you did, the, the development? programs that you were actually involved with and just describe the technology that you were developing and, and perhaps I don't know if there are any particular any other particular personalities that you, you worked oh, with well, you let's have. try that um, if we start with um, Blue Street immediately after the war people had thought about ballistic missiles, so Super V2 and a scheme was put together as much by advice by the Germans that we'd got uh, for something that would look like it had about 800 to 1,000 mile range. I think we called it Hammer. Um, people did sums to say how big a ballistic missile would be. And they were started saying, but 10 foot diameter and 100 foot long, that's ridiculous. You know, you couldn't possibly have a missile like that because it turned out that's what Blue Street had to be. You see, yeah. But certainly in the 40, uh, late 40s, it wasn't on. And it needed a breakthrough before people came back to it. And the breakthrough really was actually saying, well, we have this view that nuclear weapons can develop to two stage, you know, thermonuclear weapons. And you get like a megaton, which means you could miss the target by two or three miles, which then makes the whole thing of ballistic missiles, the idea, uh, uh, sensible. So in 1953, the RE was asked to start looking at the technology issues that would go with a ballistic missile. And there were various studies done on uh, what sort of material would we make it of? You know, could we make it of beryllium? Could we make it of titanium? And it turned out that stainless steel was probably the best bet and so on. The guidance control people uh, looked hard at uh, what the tricks necessary. There were people actually saying, well, we're going to have to launch from a silo, so what sort of, do we have to know about that? And in particular, the problem, what about re-entry? And they say, well, what's the heating light as you come into the atmosphere at Mark 18 to 20? And that was the big problem. It was the one area where I think we were starting with uh, a blank sheet. With the rocket engines, uh, Westcott had um, had the Alpha, Beta, Gamma and Delta series of motors of increasing size. And the Delta motor was halfway house to a big enough motor for um, a, a ballistic missile, big ballistic missile. And if the UK had been on its own, it would have developed the equivalent motor to the one that Rolls-Royce got in the end. But perhaps two or three years longer before we got it. And the urgency that everybody had was such that 
um, they'd realised that the American, the North American aviation motor would do. Um, we were putting together these bits. And let's be fair, a ballistic missile is a tin can with an engine on one end and a payload on the other. Um, we looked seriously at did the payload have to be at the other? Could it be at the bottom end as well? You know, and it's quite practical to be at that end, you know, because then you don't have to push it all the way up this long tank and so on. Um, but conventional ideas for one age in the end there. And we were, we were making reasonable sort of progress along that, those sort of lines. Um, I'll say the idea of a small warhead, um, well, well, I say small, we're talking about four and a half thousand pounds. Uh, the problem with that is that the requirement, the staff requirement was saying, we want 2,000 miles. Then they said, no, we want two and a half thousand miles because places like Baku are that far away. You know, there was key industrial parts, you know, of Soviet Russia. Um, and we had a problem because it was basically saying, if you can make the warhead 2,000 tonnes, uh, 2,000 pounds, I should say, you know, um, we can have a, a single engine vehicle like Thor to a date to be. Um, and if it's 4,500 pounds, it's got to be a two engine. And when pressed, all the master had to admit they didn't really know what they were doing, you know, what the design was going to be. But they were fairly sure, Penny was fairly sure that the 4,500 pound vehicle was on, whereas the lighter one was a bit problematic. At that stage, you know, we're talking about 55. So, so CGW, I remember him actually saying, well, it's going to have to be the two, two engine version of it. You know, this is why Blue Street turned it to be side. But at that point, of course, we were basically then got on with it. You know, um, the Black Knight vehicle was pursuing in the same time scale, and we started to have potential problems. Uh, oddly enough, the f I think the first Black Knight we flew, there are all sorts of minor problems, of course, as you would expect. One that what did worry us, and I was involved in, was it did look like the engine blade got hot. So we went down to Osborne a factory on Cowes um, and had a look at the layout and so on. And you suddenly realised that although there were four engines and four plumes, when you got to higher altitude, these plumes expanded and mixed. And once the plumes interacted, there's a re reverse flow up inside. And this rather hot flow was actually burning through the cables. So what did we do? Well, we just put thermal protection on all the cables. Then we thought, ah, if we're pressurising the engine bay, that means we get thrust on the base of the missile, the order of a PSI, don't we? What can we do to capture this and get a bit more thrust out the engine? So we came up with a... Um, we did some wind tunnel tests and came up with a scheme of a series of holes around the um, equipment section with louvers on them, which would be closed when it was subsonic, because then that helped us, and then opened higher up. So in fact, we got the benefit of pressurisation. You know? So um, if you look at Black Arrow in the Science Museum, you can see this in the engine bay of the first stage as well as a trick there. It, was worth a thousand pounds thrust, you know, it for nothing. <laughs> it was worthwhile. Um, technology, we made the, we were going with Black Knight, we thought we'd um, go for very thin material. I remember it was 22 gauge sheet. Um, and to hold it together, we needed not only pressurization, but long johns on the outside. Uh, we built one, a prototype, and um, testing at Farnborough and at Cowes, we couldn't cure the leaks. The skin was too thin, you know, um, and you almost said, oh, I'm going to have to plate this or something like that. And you said, well, if I'm doing that, I just want to go up a grade. And having an upper grade of material, we didn't need the ex external long joints, so on. Um, those are what I would call normal development problems in, in terms. Um, the team... Our team was pretty small still, as I said always, so the same handful of people were involved in everything. Um, the Rinchi experiments, um, although Harold Robinson was overall responsible for the, the project, 
Um, and Harold I'd known um, in 1953, I'd come to the RE as a vacation student and I was working for Harold Robinson, who in those days was an SSO. Um, and we were doing, he was doing guided weapon trials at, at Lark Hill where he was measuring the vibration occurring, not by telemetry because there was never the bandwidth, but by a series of cables. And my job was measuring the cables. Now, when I say measuring the cables, 400 feet or more of it, you know, I was given these great big spools of cable, you know what Pirelli's to the BC. And I was out on the road outside of the Q134 building and I spent day after day rolling this by hand up the road to get the length of cable and then pushing it back and another length of cable and so on because there were like 20 or 30 cables in a strand and things like that. And I had to design um, a test box Again, good exercise for a student, you see, uh, just to see about continuity and things of that Sorry, sort. Sorry, can I just... Yeah. It's just there was a, some reversing buzzer going on in the background there, which was always a bit distracting, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, do you want to just pick up again from... Um, you were rolling the cables Oh, sorry, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, that, that's how I came to know Howard Robinson. And we got noted, because he was a large man on my build. And we used to go around from site to site on his Bantam motorcycle, <laughs> causing a lot of amusement. Um, now, the Black Knight experiments were designed by Ralph Ulrich, who, again, was an ex-German, who, as an apprentice, had been with Siemens in, in Germany before and during the war. And they actually had worked on the fire control um, hardware for the Bismarck. You know, so as he said, I feel slightly responsible for sinking the hood. <laughs> but he came over to the UK after the war with his wife. One of those um, uh, most interesting stories. There's a, a man here, Jim Sedgwick, who was quite close to him, who tells the tale very well about um, Ralph. Um, Ralph designed the, the rent vehicles with a single man from the drawing office. Um, and I used to be dragged in to actually say, well, we thought of doing this. What do you think of that? You know, and that sort of question. Um, all seemed to be, on reflection, rather informal. There was no committee, no approval and things like this, you know. It was sort of, uh, will you hurry up with the drawing so we can get a factory to make it? Uh, um, Bits were made, I say, the ROF Patrikov were a good source because uh, they had another vote, as it were. Um, but local contractors were involved in making things. Um, for Dazzle, for example, we asked to have one made, a wrench vehicle made in fused silica because we wanted um, some basic materials, uh, PTFE, the you know, Teflon, uh, copper, um, Gerestus, which is a, a, a very um, good plastic, but very messy, and so on. And few silica, you know, glasses are of uh, well characterised behaviour. So we went up to this firm at Newcastle, a glass blowing firm. And they did um, made things by uh, uh, putting a mould in sand and, and getting the, a big ball of glass and blowing into it, into it, it filled the, the mould and so on. So we said, well, we can't give you, we haven't got the contract or anything like this, but so I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll give you a hundred quid, you know, uh, to start, you know, just to actually show willingness and things like this, you see. So they went on, they made us um, a number of bits. We had to make it in three sections, uh, a number of bits. And of course it came out covered with crud, you know, really crude material on the outside. And we had to get the stuff down to farm with the machine. And at the end of that programme, we phoned them up and said, we haven't heard anything from them. He said, no, he said, we're, we're wondering what to do with what remains of the hundred quid. <laughs> you know, these things cost pennies. <laughs> it really was funny. Um, and the only way we could make the wrench of vehicle was to put the bits of glass together with asbestos felt in between each bit, you know, to stop it chipping each other and so on. The other thing we discovered is that in machining it, we had to machine with diamonds. Um, and I remember uh, we used to get fed up because bits would go away overnight and come in the morning and find the bit, the bit being machined and cracked. 
So I, we stood there. I stood there along with the team, actually saying, "Well, what are we, what are we going to do about this? You know, is somebody coming in at night and poking it, things like that?" And as we stood there, there was this mighty bang from the lathe, you know, and it shattered in front of our eyes. The stress relief, you know, takes hours in class. Nobody told us, as it were. Um, but we succeeded, in it, and we flew, and it worked very well. Um, the ones that were made of copper, we wanted spheres and cones, and so on. And it was sort of, well, hey, do we machine this, you know, get it all done. And somebody told us about this uh, garage in North London, you know. So we went up to see them. It's basically a bunch of West Indians. And it was all done by, I won't say by hand, they wore an armoured vest. And the tool was like the lathe bit, only it was this size, you know. And they stood there, and it's, the bit of copper was spun, and they just did it in front of your very eyes. <laughs> what I call Victorian engineering, you know, it's not quite what we expected, and so on. Because you couldn't do it with beryllium, but you could do it with copper. Uh, and that's what made it things tonight. Oh, there's another one. We tried to put a tungsten ballast on the front of a re-entry vehicle. Now, the problem with tungsten is how do you drill into it? You know, and we had this piece delivered of basically heavy metal. Um, and we said to the, the metallurgy people at, at RE, so well, I want to drill and tap two threads to screw it into the rest of the vehicle. <laughs> they laughed, you see. So uh, we'll have a go. So they tried various bits. They couldn't actually make any impression on it. So we took it to the forge and they said, ah, well, let's try doing it hot, you know. So they would heat it up until it glowed and see whether you could do anything. To which they say, mm, can't touch it. So we phoned up the firm and actually say, hey, we're trying to drill and tap the bit of metal you've given us. What do we do? They said, ah, well, we'll come down with suitable taps for you. you know? So there we were at a weekend. Weekend, of course, because that's safer. You know, that we had, uh, with this thing there, in tongs, you know, glowing white in front of you, or somebody wearing heavy leather gaze, you know, <laughs> to, to tap a screw. And we tried things like um, splutter, cutting and things like that. And we tried all sorts of advanced techniques which had failed and so on. So all this is what made life in those days quite interesting. Um, you don't get away with it nowadays, um, partly because the contractors, like, let's say like Huntings, um, used, used to have model shops. And basically with a model shop, like the RE had, you could go in with a sketch of what you'd like. And the man there, the foreman, would convert that into something sensible. Mm -hmm. You know, produce, talk to you. He knew what you wanted. He knew from past experience what that meant and actually could do it. Hundings discovered this was not a cheap way of doing things. And they, like most other companies, gave up model shops in the 70s. You know, um, rather sad. They produced a, a cheaper thing, but it took somewhat longer to get it done and so on. Um, uh, we lost out on that direct sort of contact and so on. Uh, part of the glories of technology was actually finding out who could do what. Uh, for the crusade program we wanted to fly a, um, an interferometer and a spectrometer. The problem would be it had to be one that could survive 70 g deceleration during re-entry and a lot of vibration. So John Prentice, who uh, he's left his mark on this country because at the end of the Black Knight program, he went with Joe Lyons to the road research site at uh, Crowthorne. And his one contribution is, you know, it rained about, you go out and about, you see these yellow lines that get progressively closer. That's John Prentice's contribution <laughs> to British society. Uh, but we went round to various firms to see about uh, there. And um, I can remember... Perhaps I was learning to drive at this time, I might say. So although he was supposed to have driven me to these meetings, he let me drive. You know? It was always amusing because it always seemed to be you drove into the sun in the morning and into the sunset at night, wherever we were going. Um, so we went to see these firms and actually they would take us around to show us where they were with spectrogra 
uh, spectrographs, and with interferometers, and so on. Um, and of course, they were all very impressive, and things like this, you know. And then you slowly realise that, in fact, nearly everybody had their equipment mounted on a, a huge stone or cast iron table, firmly stabilised. You know. So when we get into the meeting afterwards and actually say what our specification was, you know, in one place they just closed the, the folder and said, that's it, you know, nice to have met you. <laughs> we not even gone to bed. We got to Aldermaston, to their optics group, of course, who were used to making instrumentation to go with nuclear tests, you know. And they were the only people in the country who didn't actually laugh and say, you know, you're asking for the impossible. You know? In fact, the um, interferometer, which was obviously going to be very difficult, um, they made prototype spectrometers and interferometers. Uh, and the spectrometer was very clever because the optical path was very complex with very clever mirrors involved in it but to get it in the size and weight required. Uh, when we actually said about robustness, they picked up the interferometer and dropped it on the floor and picked it up. So, yeah, it still works. <laughs> you know? um, unfortunately, as I say, the programme got cancelled by the time we were actually putting all the experiments together. But that was part of the fun of it. Um, in Chevelin days, trying to find firms that produced cables that were EMP proof or connectors that were in the days when that was cutting edge technology and people really hadn't started to address the problems. That was quite interesting to talk to firms and things like this. Um, similarly with all the semiconductors, we were looking for high reliability semiconductors um, and the firms, well we had to go abroad for them. You know, 50% of it came from the States but some of the others, Portugal and Hong Kong, and so on. <clears throat> in fact, the great thing about Chevrolet is where all the bits and pieces came from. The, um, when we were um, saving mass, we had to decide, I, mean, I, I was a superintendent at that stage, uh, how did we save mass? Well, use titanium, where we were actually using steel or aluminium. Um, now, the problem with titanium is where do you get the titanium from? Because the world buys its scrap titanium from the Russians. Right? The delightful thing was is that from the uh, reference numbers on the, the scrap that we got for the, our job, it, obviously they were the actuators for the Galosh ABM vehicle. <laughs> we took them down to BAE at Filton you know, and say, so can you make something out of this? And they said, well, you know, there's too many impurities in this for what we're used to doing this, so they had to uh, refine it all and so on. The propellant for the motor, uh, the upper stage motor on Chevrolet was... Um, Red fuming, inhibited red fuming nitric acid and mixed amines, which is a sort of a UDMH. Uh, and again, that was bought from the French, uh, who got it from the Russians. Um, and the reentry vehicles were made of um, really phenolic resin reinforced with uh, fused silica, but fused silica that had been spun into webs and then knitted into a three dimensional. Um, Matrix. There's a lovely model of that in Aldermaston in the Aldermaston Historical Collection, which is unclassified. Um, you have to book to get in, you know, and be accompanied. But they give you a very good tour. Um, and I don't actually, personally, I mean, Kate's here. Well, see the reason why you couldn't actually go and take pictures because it's unclassified and so on. Yeah. And there's a very good model of how you actually make something at 3DQP and so on. Uh, yeah, so... You get it from where you can. You know? um, another bit on uh, Chevrolet was the base frame, the triangular base frame. Um, quite late on, it was realised that it didn't have enough torsional rigidity. And when I say quite late on, one of the design cases for Chevrolet was that it had to survive a nuclear depth charge at eight kilometres away. Uh, the submarine had to... But the submarine had to be... Um, be safe but not necessarily serviceable, which meant the sailors could have their legs broken, but you couldn't have leaks, as it were. Um, but then the problem was, what did the net, how did the detonation promulgate to the sub hull? How did that get to the launch? How did that get to the missile and up the missile into the top end? Because what you wanted to know is that when you put the to prototype top end on a shop facility, Hey, bigger bang did you give it? You know, what was the test case? Uh, 
it involved the Navy, Lockheed's, the US Navy, uh, Hunting's, well, everybody, you know, a great big there, uh, with nobody really up to speed in the topic. You know, the Navy had worried about um, depth charge attack in a crude sort of way. Lockheed's had worried about what happened to the front end, but never with sort of complicated ge geometry that we had on the front end. So, on, you know. so really, we had to find out how to do it and how to model it. And we employed, um, I wish I could think of his name there, the man at um, BAE at Weybridge, who were the world experts at that stage in finite element modeling of structures. And we got them to coordinate everybody's efforts. Um, they did a very good job. And at the end of it, the other people involved were probably as good at doing that sort of work as any other else in the world, and so on. Um, so it was quite long before we actually discovered what the shock was we had to expose it to. And it was when we did the test, you realised it needed a stiffen. Then we went to go around the company saying, well, you know, the alloy that we've chosen isn't good enough. You know? And we found a company that actually said, well, we've got a new one coming through which hadn't got its BS spec yet but it has just the characteristics you're wanting to so we were the first commercial users of that particular um, alloy and so on um, yeah it's and a... part of the fun was certainly with Chevrolet that everything you touched interacted with everything else you know so the only way you could decide what to do is to have the few people who actually understood what it was all about there to actually say, can we do this? You know, here are the ideas. You know, which one doesn't upset everything else? I was going to, I mean, the, the question I was going to, this, this, is, this is just what I wanted. I mean, it's basically yes. just, um, you, you sound as though you thoroughly enjoyed the time that you were working in these projects. And, yeah, and how, how I would have about, liked to, sorry, but, yeah. Uh, Yes. I would have liked to bid on the space program, you know, but in 1964, they, they said to me, um, in space department, the launcher work is not going to proceed. Um, once your Aldo works up, we'd like you to go into spacecraft and worry about thermal balance of spacecraft. To which I said, no, I couldn't see I could see the, the UK spacecraft work running down and so on. So no, as far as I'm concerned, I'd rather go into weapons department. And I was quite happy to pick up the... In the end, I'd rather have a challenging job than actually um, chase stars, as it were. You know, um, I suppose I've always been interested in delivery system issues rather than the end experiments and so on. Um, I mean, great thing about weapons, nuclear weapons, you know, not really been worried about the bomb part of it, but very interested in actually getting it there and all the problems that go with it. I mean, we have a current problem. When I say current problem, there is a problem that exists at the moment that none of the countries who build re-entry vehicles have solved the problem of actually surviving through severe weather. You know, the problem with severe weather, where it's snow, ice, snow, uh, rain and so on, you know. If you fly very fast through the, the mechanical impact erodes the heat shield, you know, such you can't be sure of surviving. And the problem is that there are periods of moderate weather, anyway, normal rain as it were, where you can't guarantee you'll get through. And the difficulty um, is that weather varies not only with time at one spot, but with distance all the time, you know. In other words, the Met Office says, we can give you a mean global picture, but we can't tell you what the weather is like where you've actually done your experiment. You know? And nobody, of course, ever does flight trials in bad weather, because you can't measure anything, you see, or it won't survive. You know? So we've no experimental evidence either. So we have a, a problem which is too complex to handle or has been in the past too complex to handle. Oh, we just don't know. Um, as I say, it's very difficult. It would have been very difficult to tell Mr. Thatcher and say, well, you can't use Trident today because it's raining in Moscow. You see? 
to which we expected it, that the predicted our answer would be, it's, it's all right, it's raining here as well. <laughs> you know, um, it's one of those things there. And the, the issue, um, besides, of course, the, the problem, I mean, the Americans get over the problem by having lots of missiles, you know, and you fire vehicles spread over time at places, so eventually one or other uh, will get through regardless. The UK, with its idea of having one subload, everything arrives at one time. Well, say like, well, over 10 minutes or something like that, you know. And therefore, we don't just lose one wrench of vehicle, we might, lo might lose the lot, you know. Uh, so you have to exert, exert a lot more care. Now, the problem, as I see it, is that global warming, you see, not only does it heat the atmosphere up, so the atmosphere profile in 50 years' time will be different, it is to know, you know, if it's 10 degrees warmer at the grain, you know, the whole, that affects the entire profile, density profile, and therefore the behaviour of things coming in. But as far as one can tell, the one effect is the, um, the breaking down of the Gulf Stream circulation and what that means the climate distribution around the world. So that places like the Middle East, which are currently are dry most of the year and so on, uh, may not be. And the monsoon, which means places which are wet and un you, which you can't attack for a good portion of the year, that monsoon may go somewhere else. You know? The need is to get people to say, not what will happen, we don't care about what will happen, we, I mean, we'll find out in due course anyway, but somebody should actually say, what do the predictions tell us might happen, and therefore what sort of things should we be thinking about? of the long term. Is there research programmes, long term research programmes, we ought to investigate in all that? Now that's not space programme of course, um, but let's be honest, the technology required, I mean if you're worrying about weather, I bet what they're going to do is put up a satellite and look at it from above. I mean cloud cover is what the Met Office rely on for statistics of uh, weather over uh, Russia for example or anywhere else and so on. Um, and they can recognise from what they see what particular um, meteorological feature is there and therefore, you know, can tell you what it actually is like in terms of profile and things of that sort. But it does need a, it's a huge information gathering exercise and it really would stretch our capabilities in IT at the moment. It's all exciting, you see. <laughs> Challenges. I'll just stop for a second. No. Our second son got a rollicking from a teacher because they were saying what... Oh, yeah. But that was from... Um, okay. Yeah, talk to me about the fact that you couldn't discuss what you were doing. First. Yeah. Um, well, it was very difficult because, in fact, um, not only was there security issues involved, but how do you explain the technical things you were involved in? Particularly... Um, it, the, the current problems you didn't understand yourself. You know, that's why you were rushing around trying to sort things out. And I suppose from 62 onwards, my, you know, I would describe my job as a troubleshooter because that's exactly what I was doing. Um, there were junior, well, there was other staff doing the more routine work and getting things out, you know, and I was stuck with all the problems. Of course, you know, what do you expect? Yeah. So, yes, um, there was like the time um, I came back from Australia. Uh, I arrived at Bryce Norton on a Thursday, and the local paper showed the uh, French Atlantic aircraft having crashed on this building at Farnborough. Uh, so I got very worried when I got into the office on Friday to get a message saying, I have to be in Paris on Monday. And I have to get approval from D Science, who's visiting the SPAC show. So they gave me a ticket, a ticket and sent me over to the air show to find him. <laughs> you know, they had to go in and out all the chalets looking for him, you know, to get him to approve something. He was not at all pleased. <laughs> but that was the sort of thing. There was also, uh, I got to a meeting in Paris. Well, I had flu. So they laid me on the table in the office next door and dressed me through the wind, through the doorway. You know, they wouldn't have me in the same room because I had flu. You know, but I had I was required to, to attend the meeting. <laughs> no, it um, was. Yeah. Talk, to, so talk, like, to me, talk to me about what well, might have been. Then. Yeah. Um, 
The what might have been uh, were all about how do we exploit what we had. Um, we had designed for Blue Streak a second and third stage using initially using the Black Knight technology. Uh, not, not like putting a Black Knight on top of it, but actually the HTP kerosene stage, but a nice fat, short fat stage and so on, which we had very high confidence in. And that's what we went, what we were proposing to Aldo to do. Um, we kept that going till all went into 1964 in case there are serious problems with the French and the Germans and so on. We also, as I say, knew that the hydrogen oxygen upper stage would be an option and got the Westcott work there and did a lot of work, really a lot of work on what a Black Knight, either Mark I or Mark II version with an upper stage of that sort would be like and its ability to launch satellites. Um, and I say, it's just very sad that all those just run off into the sand for political reasons. You know, in other words, they'd agreed to other countries would do the bit. With Black Knight, with Black Arrow, um, the important bit was that if we took the first two stages, we could launch the entire front end, the improved front end of Polaris on a Black Arrow with Umrah. With no new facilities, no new problem, it could be done straight away. And we'd had 20 minutes or more out of the atmosphere. It had been ideal for what we wanted to do. Also, if we eliminated the second stage but used the wax wing, we could have used that to drive, like we had used with um, Black Knight. Um, first stage up, the uh, wax wing then was used to drive the experiment back into the atmosphere. And it would have pushed the payload the same size and weight of what we were trying to fly on Polaris. So again, we could have had a cheap experiment, well I say cheap, relatively cheap experiment, but one which we knew all about and so on. Um, and a lot of effort was made at Farnborough and in London to try and get approval for it. Where it fell down, unlike the previous scheme, not for political, well, what sort of political reason, the government was not prepared to spend money in industry at that point in time. You know, so we lost state. The alternative was actually to buy redstone rockets. Uh, the Sparta program in Australia used redstones uh, because the American habit is not to throw any rocket away. Right? So at the end of Sparta, there are still 24 rockets available in the States. Uh, so we inquired about a dozen of them. Then we discovered one of these dozens was actually outside the Smithsonian Museum. And I think London actually got called feet at this point about what on earth would the media make of the UK getting a museum rocket for its work. Um, Black Arrow, a lot of studies have been done on its satellite capability. So from there on, it was what could we do? Uh, we re-looked at Polaris a number of times to see whether we could use Polaris uh, launchers for launching satellites. It had slightly better capability than Black Arrow, but it needed a revised guidance system. Now what, we had a Black Arrow guidance system, so on, we just had to get the compatibility with the vehicle, which no date would involve just working with Lockheeds, which would have been very expensive, and so on. But again, real effort went into looking at that possibility, particularly um, when we got into the 80s, where we knew our Polaris motors were getting old. And by getting old, um, we had improved the crack detection equipment to discover every one of our motors was actually full of minor cracks. You know, we hadn't worried before because we couldn't detect them. So we then investigated every motor we had and test fired the worst. And it was all right. In other words, we, we, no problem. But the other thing is that the plasticizer in the propellant began to seep. And in the submarines, there was a bucket underneath the missile to pick up the bits and pieces, you know. And although we were sure this was no problem, in the end, the Apple T chicken date and got remotoring. So there were 60 odd sets of motors. So, of course, we were looking hard at what we do with it. Um, a serious study um, on when we were worried about air for bombardment, the thing that turned out to be JP233 um, was in fact delivering it ballistically 
using these Polaris motors and so on. Um, that was quite exciting. Um, it was quite a viable idea until you realised how many missiles you had to fire uh, to train the teams that were firing. Because, um, you know, the British Army had lancers in, in, in West Germany and each firing team fired at least one lance a year at Ben Bekula. Uh, and when you start to work at eight, you actually discover that three quarters of the missiles you bought actually were used up in training. You know, um, that really spoilt the idea of doing it that, that sort of way. We've looked over the years at how, like, putting strap-on boosters on the Black Arrow to get um, much more capability. And I suppose if we'd stayed with Black Arrow, it would have developed enormously because um, the first thought was to put two basically Skylark you know, Rook motors on each side and so on to up it. But it could have um, ended up with Stone Chat sized motor, which again was a motor that we had already. The Stone Chat was another, the basis of another vehicle that we intended to build because in parallel to the guide of weapons work and ballistic missiles, there was aero department doing aerodynamic research with rocket-propelled vehicles. Certainly in the 50s, it was the only way to get transonic speeds because wind tunnels didn't work then. And then later on, it was the only way to get really high uh, Reynolds numbers that marked numbers of four or five. And a lot of work was done on Concorde, uh, boosted on these things. Um, in many aerodynamic problems actually were examined that sort of way. And in the end, there was a felt need to get up to Mark 10 because Dietrich Kuchmann, um had done a study about what was the future required. And he concluded that um, nobody wanted to travel more than three or four hours anywhere. You know, uh, anything that reduced the time was worthwhile, which is all right. There's Mark II to New York, you know, Concord, Thing like that. But to get to Australia, you want to mark six to eight and so on, you know. So we needed a test vehicle that got that. So it had to be obviously in Australia. So they concocted a design, Hyperion, which had a stone chap first stage, um, something like a rook uh, second stage, and a lobster or gosling for the upper stage, which would get to mark 10 and push quite substantial um, airplane sized models. Well, say airplane, you know, sort of really large thing up to the right sort of speed and to fly at the sort of altitude that the full-size vehicle would fly at and so on. The trouble was by the time we got around to 68, um, the money for this sort of thing had disappeared. You know, I think the government said, you know, the scientists, the engineers are not going to push on the greater and greater speeds. You know, we're just not going to afford it. Uh, there we were left with a test vehicle the aero department had put together um, and no sponsor. So we in Weapons Department was asked, were we interested? So I looked at this and I had a talk with the colleagues at Aldermaston over it because um, we were very worried that uh, Polaris improvements meant a lot of Polaris shots in the States and would have been incredibly expensive. So we thought, is there a cheaper way of doing fundamental work? And we actually said, well, there's this stone chat motor, you know, what could we do with that? And began to do the sums and began to realise, yes, we could do almost the things that we'd like to have done with Black Arrow. We could have done using a stone chat booster. And that's how we, we switched onto that. But the stone chat itself was designed for another job. And the big fins it had were designed because it was meant to stabilise three stage vehicles, each stage having big fins of its own sort of right. But the, the stone chat vehicle... Um, it was a cobble together. The nose fairing was the one that Saunders Row had made for the French Diamante um, satellite launcher, and so on. You know, in other words, a bit from here and a bit from there, and so on, and cobbled it together. But we had people in these companies who'd done it before and knew what we were trying to do. You know, didn't require strong management. They just got on and did their bit. You know, um, I think it, we, not only were we very successful in what we did, as it were, you know, in a sense of the success of the mission, you know, but it's a very good example of what the British could do at that sort of stage. 
since. Um, I mean, once we got Trident and so on, uh, we also got the Americans starting SDI. And that was another uh, interesting exercise. But the problem is that the Americans were prepared to spend, prepared to spend money in the UK uh, to have a fresh look at things, because I think they had got to a stage of respecting the fact as a small country um, where our, our, not only the country's motivations, but the way we looked at things was different from theirs. Uh, they couldn't think about how would the Chinese or how would the Iraqis think about things. And the Americans didn't have the sort of culture that thought that way. Mind you, the culture was different anyhow, because if you get Kate to talk about anglicisation, or Americans to talk about Americanization of British designs. You know, um, a good example was that on when they decided to build Canberras, you know, we sent out a complete set of drawings of the Canberra, and they couldn't do with it until they'd redrawn it to American standards, because um, in almost every aspect, the way they do drawings, the way they handle um, uh, tolerances and things of that sort. Their culture is different. You know, when we come to anglicise an American design, whether it's a warhead or an airplane, again, it's a real struggle. Even a company like Sperry's, who have a, an American you know, headquarters and a British branch, they used to make the people from Bracknell spend six months over at uh, Phoenix going through with a fine tooth comb the American design for something that would be transferred so they really understood it and could translate into the English way of doing business. It's, I know the outside world thinks engineering is engineering, you know, but it isn't like that at all. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So I'm just, um, it's 11 o'clock. Do you, what time do you? Oh, do you, is it 11.30? I've got to have coffee. I was going to say, do you want to, <laughs> do you want to call it a day at that? And, uh, oh, no. I, are you, you sure? Are you, I'll talk you, for hours. Well, <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah. I'm just sort of aware that... I'll, I'll start. Okay. Yeah. The Aldo committees were quite interesting because of the different cultures of the, the other countries involved. Um, I think basically the British one was that we had done it. You know, we were talking for practical experience. We were very pragmatic about things. The French, um, well, all the elder meetings I went to were conducted in English, up until you wanted to place an action on a Frenchman. And if it wasn't addressed to them in best Parisian French, they didn't understand it. You know? And you could get the minutes back, you know, with a little statement saying the French did not understand the action, things like that. So, although their English was absolutely wonderful when it came to normal discussions, you know. But there were people, the, uh, the political technocrats, as it were, in Paris, who didn't come to the elder meetings, you know, um, were not actually friends of the English. Um, and that showed up later on when we were trying to work with the French in the 90s. Um, because in the 90s we had um, various Agard studies about ABM, where the American STI group was sponsoring it. Uh, and we would get together, and there it was um, trying to get the Germans and Italians up to speed in the jargon and thinking about things, and so on. You know, we even had to say, well, these are the likely trouble spots in the future, and this is the sort of things there, you know. Um, if Libya invaded Chad, you know, it's the one use of a ballistic missile which we couldn't track for firing tubs. <laughs> The thing, you know, what are you going to do about it? And like that. Everybody laughs to start with. You, know. you say, well, more serious, if the Libyans fired from Benghazi, it crosses Rome, Paris to London. You know, if you just see the direction it's going, you know, who's going to be attacked, you know, and so on. Um, they hadn't done what I would call global thinking, and they hadn't spent any money on what I would call vehicle design or countermeasure design. So we had a lot to do. It was very difficult to get from the French. The French always wanted to know what we'd done, what we'd done. You know, they were always asking. But you couldn't get what they had done. And all we could say is that we told them and they agreed to it. You know, so we thought they must know enough to understand we're telling them the good stuff. 
But whether they thought of it themselves beforehand, we didn't know. You know, it was very hard to do it. Um, it. We used to have, perhaps still have, an Anglo-French exchange on aerodynamic heating problems. It was running from about 1958 all through the 70s into the 80s. And it was basically an annual meeting. We sat down with a pile of reports each side of the table and say, I have a report on this topic. Have you got one like it? If they had, we'd swap. If not, you didn't. <laughs> you know, um, you know, it's sad. The Germans on Aldo were in a different problem. The, the leader was a professor of theoretical mechanics at university. And he had a very academic approach to everything. You know? And I can remember John Cook at the meeting at um, Hamburg, reaching over the table, grabbing him by the tie, and say, look here, mate. <laughs> you do what I say. <laughs> he was surprised. <laughs> um, but I think they, they got to understand, you know, that John Cook, for example, was uh, the expert on, on what I call design factors. In other words, the uncertainty you get is still in your mind at the end of a test. So what band did you put on that to decide what guaranteed strength you got, what guaranteed performance did you got from this one test? And if you did one test, you had to assume it was a good one. You had to decide what the bad one was. And the problem was that the RAE's work on spread and structures was a, actually, a, um, we had a set of Prentiss aircraft which we pulled apart and tested all the bits, which is hardly advanced technology. Um, we had tried to lay our hands on the TSR2s when they were cancelled, had to pull those apart as well for the same reason. Um, didn't get the same sort of access to that. Uh, we were second in the line for demanding. The people who got it were the people who were concerned with um, vulnerability and they took them down to Shrewby Ness and shot at them because they didn't have any aircraft structures they could actually damage. You know, they didn't know what modern technology, how vulnerable it was going to be and so on. But as I say, we, we, the problem there was the Germans. And how it, it spun out with Aldo was that the, I was asked, this is how it happened, I was asked in the corridor by my boss, worse not, and said, I've got somebody who's asking for an easy way of estimating the loads on the front end of a multi-stage vehicle. And I said, well, uh, I use the following tricks. You know, I have a few charts and a few simple equations. That's what I do. And I know you get in the right sort of street. Um, and obviously, if it's a bluntish body, you want to do a wind tunnel test and so on, you know. So um, a little bit later, he came around and said, your advice doesn't work. And I said, what about the caveats? He said, well, the wind tunnel test won't be done for two years. You're on the Aldo Air Dammers Committee <laughs> to sort it all out. He said, they all think it's your problem. <laughs> so off I started going to these meetings and so on. What they had done is that the Germans had taken this advice, not as a guide, but literally. And they'd made the third stage about 70% of the strength that it needed to be. And so on. You know. When the tests were done by the Dutch near um, Schiphol Airport the site and so on, which was quite interesting because you could you could, um, you could visit the Dutch and have a meal in a, in a windmill. <laughs> really, they took you to a windmill in the same way as the Germans insisted on you having uh, a sausage and sauerkraut, and the Italians insisted on a two and a half hour lunch up in the mangers with spaghetti <laughs> and so on. You know. So, or that. I forgot what we did in England. I think we just gave them sandwiches. <laughs> oh, that's not always true. Um, we had to sort out well, to the end of the story. And that's right. Yeah. Um, so we were stuck with this problem because wind tunnel tests, when they turned out, showed, yes, it definitely, the loads were significantly higher. And there was a very good reason to believe that with the winds and gusts levels that there were at Woomera, this vehicle could fail. Um, quite a high percentage chance of failing. So it was, what procedure do we have to do to monitor the atmosphere to be able to launch it? Now, I'd been asked that question before for, for Black Arrow. And for some reason, rather which escapes me now, I'd actually been monitoring all the wind 
wind and weather uh, and atmosphere profiles for the Skylark firings up to date. <coughs> so I had a database of 200 Skylark firings, which I'd analysed just for the fun of it. And I discovered, when you look at these uh, things, that, that the Australians fired Skylarks any day, any time, except meal times and bank holidays. <laughs> Not surprising, of course, you know, but it's nice to see it, it fell in there. <coughs> but I was trying to discover how it represented the set world. Because some of the things, the radio song balloons, would blow away way before it got to 100,000 feet. You know, they were seeing 300 knot winds of blowing out the horizon very early. <coughs> you know, with Black Arrow, what we did was fly the Black Arrow through these actual profiles. One man at RE did that. <coughs> <coughs> and showed that. Um, Sorry, did you want to want a drink? Wanna... It would be helpful, yes. Yeah, I'll, yeah. Stop, I'll stop recording this for a second. Winds. Um... That's right. Yes, I said I had done this analysis and so on, and I talked to Bullen, who was the expert at um, clear air turbulence and aircraft. Um, that was a very illuminating. I mean, first of all, there was the high wind profile, but as he said. The stress on a vehicle like the Aldo wasn't just wind, you know, which produced a shear load along it, but was the gust side of it. Um, so I got a, a, a man at BAE at um, Steamridge, Steamridge to provide a simple, well, I say simple, a beam type uh, model for the, the loads on the vehicle which could be evaluated on a simple computer, as it were, in real time. Um, you could let off the radio sond, and then we had to say, well, that's all very well, but that's only a third of the load. See, um, during flight, a third of it, the strength of vehicles is to do with the longitudinal thrust. A third is to deal with the winds, and the other to deal with the gusts. So we started looking at gusts. So we got out the literature, the RE literature, on gusts on aircraft. I said... But just a minute, all this is about an airplane that flies this way, and we're talking about the vertical component of gusts. And the missile's going this way, and we're talking about the horizontal component regardless of direction. So the structure department in Bullen, um, we got him to do the analysis again, in, um, now for the right situation. Of course, he was quite intrigued. You know, he wanted to know, well, how did this turn out? So, you know, it was interesting because for aircraft, it comes out in terms of the exponential functions, and anybody can do that analysis. Right? In terms of missile, it's modified Bessel functions of the second kind. <laughs> you know, it's a much more difficult thing to evaluate. So we ended up with Watson, which is a great big fat volume. About all, all you ever need to know about Bessel functions to play through that, to discover how to evaluate these and make some sense. Um, but it was a very good example of where the problems of aircraft and missiles are similar physically, but when you work them out, the numbers don't carry across at all. In fact, the numbers do not carry across from one missile to another because the thrust, that's the velocity time profile, varies from missile to missile, and therefore there's relative importance of things. Too. So, um, so we came up with um, a formula to actually say, and what's more, it was quite clear, we're talking about clear air turbulence and there was a jet stream across there, so I had to understand the meteorology generated jet streams and where was the jet stream at certain times of the year and things of that sort. Um, that was all a fascinating sort of thing to get involved in anyhow, I might say, you know, if you can do, understand why there's a desert in Australia, it's because of the jet stream, or perhaps the jet stream's there because of the desert in Australia, I'm not quite sure which is, comes first, you know, but they are intimately connected. So we had this business, so we were then told, all right, you have to write up the procedure. What do you do before lunch? So the man from um, Steamridge, who had, you know, did the calculations, you know, he said, well, I'll come down. I said, well, I'm now working in weapons department, and I can't get you in for an unclassified visit to do unclassified work. Now, bearing in mind, I'm now, I've got my management breathing in my back saying, hey, what are you still working on Eldo for? You're in weapons, you know? So, yeah, so. Um, what he used to do, he used to book one of the bars in the Thatch Cottage in Prosper Avenue in Farnborough. And we start at nine o'clock and the publican would come into the bar and we'd get our first drink at nine o'clock. We spread all the drawings out across the billiard table and get on and work. 
<laughs> through the day. It, it really was most delightful session. <laughs> so, um, it, the procedures worked in the sense that, uh, yes, there were one or two delays in elder launches, but when they launched, it, there, there were no problems. The only irritating thing is that a Frenchman wrote it all up, you know, and didn't actually make any reference to the fact that we had done all the basic background work and things like that, gave them the, the database and all these things that went into it. So I was a little irritated by that, but par for the course, I think, <laughs> for doing that. I think we'd better... Yes. Yeah, I've done... And to be honest, if you, if you feel, you know, like chipping in at any time, that there's anything you uh, feel we ought to be asking, please do so. Okay, I'm um, yeah. recording. Um, I'll say, to be quite honest, uh, my career has not been 100% devoted to rocketry. Um, sometimes I get, I've been involved professionally in studies of other things. You know, um, there was a time about 1980 where we had an exercise to see, well, what sort of technical help could we give to third world countries? And particularly the thought was, well, there must be a lot of Victorian and Edwardian engineering, which is very relevant to other people's needs. Um, it seemed a very good idea until we investigated what the situation was like in Pakistan and India. And we found there that almost every village had a small mechanics workshop, better equipped than most of ours in this country. And at Madras, for example, um, None of the locals, local industries, let's say like cotton industry, you know, wanted any technical help. What their problem was is that they were all at the mercy of the loan sharks, you know, where like 60% of their income went to somebody else. And what they needed was help to break the cycle away. Um, if that could be done, they could get on quite well. They had all the ideas, all the plans and things like this. It's all seemed wonderful. Um, during that period, an American company, General Motors, went to look at these third world countries and came back saying, they've all got better factories than we've got. No, um, what these organized, what they lacked wasn't imagination, you know, it's really the opportunity uh, to break out and to do things and so on, you know, and that remains the problem of these countries and so on. I mean, that, that was one aspect of it. Um, we looked at, um, at other times at uh, how establishments run, you know, were we having the right sort of overall organisation skills and things of that sort, you know. Um, these things, they arrive out of questions in Parliament and they very often were ill-conceived questions, you know, and the end result is the report was not effective at all. Um, we had a, a major well, run-in, I'd like to say, but in 1982, the Public Accounts Committee of Parliament um, had its go at uh, Chevelin because Parliament hadn't been told, although quite a few of the MPs knew all about it, I might say, um, and they said it was unaccountable, it was all done in a non-democratic way, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and they slated the project very hard. But that's because they were briefed by the wrong people who were doing their best, actually, to make their position appear good. You know, um, and we br had to break the civil service rule. You, you don't comment you know, on, publicly on these things like this. But people like Frank Panton and Peter Jones have had to stand up and say, hey, you know, it wasn't like that. You know, we ran a project that was actually uh, managed, reported it to all the best standards that were applied to projects in the 70s and into the 80s. You know, quarterly reports, long lists of all the progress and the outstanding problems and what the outstanding problems might involve and things like this. So there was no excuse other than the fact you couldn't cope with the fact that people didn't necessarily read the document or if they did read it, didn't understand it. And I'm having a battle with historians at the moment, people like um, Kristen Stoppard, you know, who's working for the National Archive, of which there's a huge release of documents going on, um, they find the but they're not applying the who wrote what to whom for what purpose rule. You know, as we say, if something in London was written by a wing commander or lower, you know, he doesn't know what he's talking about anyhow. 
You know? If somebody's written by somebody in the sixth floor in the main building, he probably doesn't know because he's entirely dependent on perhaps two layers of briefing up to that. Having said that, uh, a few years ago, I went to the uh, Cabinet Office Historical Group to look at the documents being prepared for release. When I say documents, the documents relevant to Polaris and Shevlin. You know, I wanted to see what, what actually the cabinet seen in the 60s and early 70s. Basically because um, I've been given a job to worry about were there any um, possibilities of leakage of sensitive technical information down these routes because people would not realise you know, what they were saying. What I found was that all the cabinet subcommittee minutes, there were like two pages per document, you know, only two pages, very seldom supporting documents, because supporting documents were too highly classified to be keep anyhow. But when I read them through, they were usually brilliantly written, you know. Um, talking to people more recently about how, to, I had a dinner in London, I sat next to somebody who had four years in the cabinet office. Uh, and I say, well, I started discussing this, saying, well, how does it all run? He says, well, quite often um, these subcommittees, oh, well, first of all, the subcommittees, subcommittee decides anything, it doesn't go up to the cabinet for approval, the cabinet just rubber stamps it. You know, other, it's all done in subcommittees regardless. That's often not realised. Um, but he said, very often ministers will leave a, a subcommittee and not know what's been agreed, but entirely. Um, reliant on the secretariat for understanding what happened. You know, so in other words, the minutes are a true reflection of what they all intended. <laughs> I'm reminded of a statement, you know, don't, you must never, this is what they said, yeah, you must never write down what they said. And what's more, you shouldn't write down what they intended to say. You know, what you should write down is what they would have said if they'd seen what you thought they said. <laughs> and this is the strength of the, of the way it's done. The documents um, are, this is where the historians fail, you see. They don't realise that what they're reading is only a reflection of what happened at the time, interpreted by people who actually understand what actually is trying to be achieved, because they've got pre-briefings and things of that sort. There's an awful lot of, um, a minister goes into a meeting, he's given a brief. Yeah. Um, there was a story about Amory, I suppose this is late 50s, yeah, that um, his staff would write asides and read on his brief as advice to keep to himself. But he would sit in the committee and actually just read everything, including the advice. You know. But he was such a nice old soul, everybody just sat and they tolerated it. <laughs> and so on. Um, so you can't actually say that the minister is on top of, always on top of things. Sometimes they are jobs for the boys, or have been in the past. Uh, having said that though, I mean, Healy was very impressive as far as I was concerned. Um, and all I ever heard about Mrs. Thatcher as PM, you know, she ran this seven um, when we were getting Trident organised and so on. Uh, done very, very competently, you know. Um, no proof that ever that she actually understood the technical things, but she understood the drift and could see what actual questions she had to ask. Um, you can always judge a good politician or a good scientist by, uh, what is good anyhow, but the fact that they ask, uh, so you can tell them things like at 19 to the dozen. Now you can pour the information in and they take it. And then they ask intelligent questions, which you can answer. You know, the bad ones, the one who asks questions, which are too complicated, too abstract, or something like that. Now, if they stop to think, they know you couldn't answer. And they're probably asking it because they're trying to score off of you in some way or the other. Now, I find in my time working with the Navy, the admirals on the whole were very responsive to hardware. Yeah, the best thing when an admiral came to Farnborough was to give him a bit of hardware to hold. You know, he could, he sort of, they felt he belonged, as it were. You know, you got the sympathy and things like this and then understanding. And you would, we'd take him to see a facility and say, look, here's our wind tunnel. This is, this is the problem. Yeah, look at it as we, 
illustrated the flow field problem and say, this is the problem we're having with heating, heating and what we have to protect and why we've got to do this and why we've got to do the other and so on. Or um, I tried to, um, during the project, to get the various companies involved to video key trials so that when you went to a meeting you could see a video of what was going on and we didn't have to all troop off and spend a day watching a trial for the five minutes that mattered and so on. And that was quite an impressive way of doing business as well. Um, oh, I was a bit of a bastard in a way because um, we found that if we went to contractors like Sparrows or Huntings, the problem was the large lunches they provided. You know? And I found my team was putting on weight. <laughs> you know? So we decided we'd, we'd try and keep the half day meetings, you see. Now, when it was meetings at Farnborough and Aldermast were involved, you know, I tried very hard to chair the meetings so that we ended way before lunchtime. Because there's nothing worse than somebody's come out prepared to have lunch out and go back leisurely in the afternoon or not at all, you know, to be faced at 11 o'clock in the morning, which is too early for lunch. And what do I do now? Do you want to talk to me? Do you want to talk to me about that? That's I'm going to say, you know, I I don't recognise the question, sort of. Um, well, let me let me think of it. The, the original team on Blue Street, the uh, head of the group I was in was Ken Weaver, who was a Cambridge mathematician. Um, his second in command, Stan Green, that's a, the end of Stan Green's on the project. But here's Stan Green. He... Uh, an ex-apprentice who'd worked for Hawkers um, and then decided the civil service was a better career for him, who turned out to be quite a competent mathematician, but he's an engineer in background and so on. Um, the man I worked for, Ian Peaty, to start with, uh, came from St Andrews, uh, notable for being an accordion player for Scottish country dancing. Um, uh, Keen bridge player and golfer, you know, and he actually did work as well. <laughs> yeah. But Monday night was bridge night or Farnborough Bridge Club night, so Tuesday morning was the post mortem, always. You know, uh, it got a bit boring, really. Um, Harry Cumming was um, a mathematician from certainly neither from Oxford or Cambridge, and he went on to Hull and was a professor of mathematics at Hull, having left us at 28. Um, the others, I mean, I came from Bristol. Another one was from Birmingham. We had a number of ex-dockyard apprentices from Portsmouth. Um, Harold Robinson was one, but Rex Chase and, and um, Jim Sedgwick had came out to the dockyard, gone on to take a degree. Uh, it was unfortunate that um, dockyard, ex-dockyard apprentices tended not to be promoted to the higher um, regime because uh, there was doubts about their wide um, deployability, which is all silly, really, because they, they would apply for posts which specifically suited them, you know, and would have done very good jobs at it. And often get the people got prepared with people who actually had a wider interest and things like this, but not going to do that particular job as well. Uh, I had certain examples of that in the intelligence field people who had just the right attitude of mind and background and so on, uh, didn't get the jobs. And the people who did get the jobs were people who, as you say, came from the wrong sort of, to my mind, the wrong sort of place. Um, another thing was that we had a lot of um, what we call engineer grades and experimental officer grades at once in the early days when I joined. And these experimental officers, the career grade was a, a senior experimental officer. Um, and somewhere about 1970-ish, they amalgamated that with the scientific grades, so all the SCOs become SSOs. So I then suddenly found myself, well, I found myself with a project, and I was told to name names, you know. So I looked around the establishment for people who I knew I could rely on and who had an experimental background. And I ended up with a dozen of these old-style SEOs. 
I found myself as first reporting officer for all these. You know. So one of the problems each year was writing out these masses of forms and letters. I had a real struggle to get any of them promoted. And the, the best of the bunch, John Ray, um, we said, well, we'll try and push him through first. It took two or three years to get into PSO. Um, there was nothing incompetent about this man. You know, John Ray, um, as a PSO, was running, well, first of all, he ran the pack design for Chevrolet. Then he ran all the flight trials. When I say ran, hands-on running the flight trials in Australia. And in the end, he ran Beedrus at Salisbury and closed the range down. Yeah, that's not a trivial job for somebody you can ignore. You know, he was very competent. And that was true of a lot of them. So, there, yes, there was a, um, a prejudice against people with a practical background, uh, both, I say, from where they came from and also the sort of work they'd done. And yet, when it came to the aero department with its facilities, each one had an experiment officer, you know, equivalent to that, uh, who ran the facility. And without that person, the facilities wouldn't have run. You know, the scientists, as it were, did the science, not the experiments. Good. Yeah. I should stop again. Yeah. Sorry about it. Oh, there is a problem about culture at these sites, and each site, each establishment has its own culture, depending on which radio service it's, it's serving, and so on. Um, the problem with Aldermaston was that it's a manufacturing facility, you know, and in many ways it's like a firm, yeah, but with security laid onto it. The RAE was all about the RAF and air armaments. You know, it was all about advising headquarters people on how to do things. The army were in at Fort Horse, and again, it was a different way of running things and so on. You know. Now, the strength of the system was that, in fact, people in London who understood the strengths and weaknesses of these places could place jobs where they actually mattered. I was saying that um, the problem with the Abbotry research people is they actually worked on the tame scale of frigates, you know, um, which didn't actually ha cope with having to do something in 10 seconds and things of that sort. You know? um, and that is lost. Now we've got kinetic and DSTL. Part of the problem seemed to be um, the invention of cost codes and getting rid of the vote. You know? All that meant was that we had to discover what was the true cost of a test facility. In other words, if you have a facility that only one person uses in a year, you know, do they have to pay the total cost of the year or some other, or should somebody else be paying for the upkeep? You know? And of course, in decided, the accountants decided you had to pay for it all. So, of course, facilities that weren't used got sold or defeated and so on. The other thing about it is the, the tendency to re reorganise on like a six-year cycle, because if you see something's wrong and you reorganise it, your replacement three years later understands what it's all about you know, and goes along with it. But the next one was not party to the original rearrangement and says, hey, all the things are going wrong. Because what happens when you reorganise is you get the benefit of the new reorganisation and all the momentum from the way it was before. You know, because people, people don't change in the meantime, so they continue with their attitudes and strengthening like this, you know. So you get a benefit. <coughs> but once you run that out, and the people of the original momentum, as it were, moved on, got promoted and things like that, you know, you suddenly find the weaknesses now of your new reorganisation because you've got nothing else to bolster it up. And, of course, this moving people on for career development, you know, that's another bane of my time. The number of people who actually said, oh, I want him to work for you for uh, three years, career development, and I want to move him on to something else. And I said, well, what use is he to me and what use is he to you afterwards? You know, he'll come on to, I think of Mike Gage, who, who came on to us, and he said, well, he'll organise the software control, he'll apply the NASA control, software control standards to the Chevrolet software that Sperry's are writing, you know, and he did a very competent job, but he left not knowing anything else about the project. You know, so where was his rider vision? Where, what did it train him to do at all? He could have done that job sitting where he was before. 
and so on, you know. Um, this moving people around. Um, I had people like Dave Aubrey moved off of the project into some other for career development. And his career didn't develop. He stayed in the same grade for the rest of his life. You know? um, and what's what the expertise that develops, you know, gets lost. You know, you have a project, and projects last like 10 years if it gets anywhere. So the real experience is somebody who's lived in the project. When we set up Chevrolet, uh, Clem Shaw said, this has got to be a young team because nobody's going to be moved on for a long time. So we had a lot of relative youngsters in their grades, anyhow. Uh, and he was quite right, you know, they were, we had them for 10 years. I know quite a few of them were told after two or three years you can move on or go back, you know. And of course, what happened in the meantime was the people who made the promises moved on themselves, you know, and their replacements didn't honour the promises. Of course, you know, they, they got stuck with it. Um, but there was that uh, fundamental bit. Now, I was pressed endlessly and saying, well, why don't you go into some other area for your career? And I said, well, the guide and weapons problems I'm familiar with, particularly guide and weapons going up and down, you know, uh, although they're common to everything, I have to address every other problem that the aircraft and guide and weapons people have, but in the peculiar context of ballistic missiles or space launchers, you know, and I don't want to relearn everything. You know, I have this intuitive grasp, you know, of what it means and what the problems are as applied to my range of problems. And I'd be stuck with air-to-air -air weapons or aircraft and things like that. But though I was very interested in Concorde and all the aerodynamic work towards it, you know, I wouldn't have made a sensible contribution to that at all. You know, and that was the real problem. Career development. The Americans solved the problem very easily because with all weapon systems, the military is in charge. You know, you find a two and a half or three striper in charge of something or other, and, but he's got civil service staff who ain't ranking by two or three grades, you know, who are career people in that field, have been in that field 20, 30 years, you know. In other words, they're quite happy to have people who specialise and get um, promoted on merit, you know, to what they deserve and given the responsibilities on, but in the end, the military's in charge. And to my mind, that's a great system. It would have helped on the weapon systems I was involved in if the military had had a, uh, a higher um, visibility all the way through. We certainly had military people on the team, you know, um, whether it was Blue Streak or, or um, Black Knight or Black Arrow uh, and Polaris. They were military people. Um, on the Chevrolet, on Polaris and Chevrolet, we had naval people, on the others there, RAF people. I didn't realise what the problem was because I was saying in 1970, um, we're going to have the problem of a trials team to do all the planning and sorting things out. And I really wanted to see a team based on people who have some experience of flying things. So I said, where are all the squadron leaders from the Thor squadrons? And you can imagine what the Navy said. Yeah? We're not having any one of them. I thought, well, what have you done? Yeah, well, they had fired one or two missiles themselves. But um, The trouble with the Navy is that they'd put officers in to monitor the construction of the, the resolution class subs. Yeah? And people had got promoted and things of that sort. But you tend to find the submariners were the same small group. They were a subset of the Navy as a whole. Yeah? So it was always the same people you met. Um, but in different posts, and unfortunately, also in peripheral posts, never actually in the centre core. But the establishment, establishers always do the pre-feasibility work. You know, when London, London says, what's the possibilities? You know, what, what should we think of? You know, it's the RAE or the other establishment, the DSTO, who actually do the thinking for them and say, these are the options. Not solving the options, but say, these are the options and what will be the technology problems and the development problems you have to face up to. And hopefully they actually think through and say, these are the problems you might have and therefore you shouldn't be surprised at anything. But my analysis of all my experience is that every project I was involved in, there was something that threw it, came up that they hadn't thought of beforehand. Point yeah. of research, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's inevitable, isn't it? Risk management yeah. doesn't mean risk that you of ignorance. It means risk of uh, you haven't got the estimates right. <laughs>
tell me you can tell me that you got interested in rockets because you were yeah. oh yes well I was interested originally for rockets because I got interested in V1 and V2 because I was on the receiving end. You know, the uh, Southampton were attacked by V1s. Um, mostly, I understand now, to have been aircraft launched, but my uncle Tom had his house demolished by one. You know? um, and V2s, well, I was actually visiting relatives in the east um, end of London it, towards the end of the war when one arrived not that far away. So I had the strong memory of the bang and the whistle up into the sky, you know, the effect of the supersonic thing like that. So I was always interested, um, even as a student. So when the opportunity came with my eldest son, who um, he'd had a habit of getting on a bicycle and touring around um, France looking at megaliths in Brittany, you know, I said, well, why don't we go and actually look at some of these V1, V2 sites that we know? So off we went for uh, um, a week looking at sites from Cherbourg around and so on, because a man called Henshaw, who lives up in Staffordshire, had written a book with little maps. Now, there were all sorts of flaws in his first book, you know, but they were good enough to find the villages and see the sites, you know, and find the V2 sites along the side of a road and in somebody's garden and things of that sort. And we found La Coupale at Wacken um, before it had been modified. And then we heard that the Ratten site had actually been cleared by the French and turned into a museum. So we got together and suggested to David. Now, David had been a friend of my son Michael anyhow at school. Um, although he was in the sixth form where my son was in, I think, the second year. Uh, but they had a, a mutual interest in war games at that time. So they got to know each other quite well. Uh, and they're still very close friends. Uh, so we said, well, why don't we go off and see um, these things? So we set off, um, yeah, got the car over uh, to um, Calais and went off to visit um, all the various major and minor sites uh, on walk around things there. And during that, um, David, who at that stage had um, written the thesis about the Cuban Missile Crisis and what it all meant, um, we tried to persuade him that this actually was a futile topic to pursue. And what was much more interesting was Blue Street, because first of all, it wasn't at all clear why and who had cancelled it and why it had been cancelled, but also the technology, all the new technology that was required uh, for it, and its impact on the UK and things like this. That was exciting stuff, and there was a lot of people you could go and talk to about that. So he went back to the university to actually say, I'm going to change the topic of the thesis. Now, at that stage, I think it was Grummet was his prof, and he was quite happy. Grummet had been writing about this sort of period anyhow, uh, quite happy. But then he moved on, and his next supervisor was politically motivated and wasn't interested in the technology issue, was only interested in the politics of it. So he found himself writing the boring bit of his thesis. Right. But we kept saying, but there are all these people, you know, all these old hands who've got stories to tell and things like this, you know. What are we going to do about interviewing them? Can we, can we uh, tape record them, things like that, you know, what should we do? And then it turned out, because he knew Nick Hill, and said, well, why, says Nick, why don't you actually have a conference down here for two or three days, you know? In the Easter holidays, he can organise it relatively cheaply. It's on the staff here and so on. Uh, it's reasonably accessible for people. Why don't we come here? So we put a lot of pain, the three of us, into well, four of us really, because with, with his wife Leslie, uh, she in, ends up as the treasurer, in effect. Um, Nick does the arrangement for the building. Leslie does the finance. David tends to find and set up the speakers. And I basically advise on the technical content, you know, what it is we should be pursuing and things like that. And that's run. The problem is, I can't even remember, we've done eight or nine years of this. <laughs> no. And what's more, every year we think we've exhausted the barrel. And by the time we get to the next autumn, there'll be a long list of people who we've spoken to or have volunteered to do something like that. And you find yourself, well, we can't have them all because it's only three days long. We're running double or triple parallel sessions already, like we're doing here this time, you know, uh, squeeze things in. And although I suppose there's no great idea what next year's going to be, 
the safe bet there will be a next year because of the fact there are too many people who want to talk or we want to, to sit and speak up. Um, the difference was the first time it was a sort of um, friendly um, in type thing and we've gradually got the academics to be involved and the, the Royal Air Society, the British Japan Society and the Mountbatten Centre have started to pull their weight in the last two years. Uh, with the Mountbatten Centre, it's because they haven't got the money to run the session, two-day session here that they could normally would have run in Southampton. You know, they get, it helps everybody, it mutually helps people because we have found that the history of British rocketry is a rain defence and, of course, nuclear delivery systems as much as anything else. We haven't got a lot of space to talk about. You know, uh, and we haven't cracked into those people in the 70s who did the satellite work yet to come and talk about things. Although we've had Kinetic, we've had Surrey, we had Beagle 2 talked about and so on. So we've had key bits, but the UK is not very fruitful on that side at all. But we have this mixture now of um, good history. Like, you know, we've had history going back to Blue Dan in 1952 as it were, um, and we've got people talking about today, amateur rocketry, and where do we go next? You know? And because the UK is interested in, um, the UK government is considering a successor system to Trident, um, there will be a hardcore people interested on in nuclear delivery, and there will be a hardcore people interested in launches and things of that sort, you know. Um, so it will continue running for a while. Excellent.